discussion on the importance of good financial uh, planning and management, and we'll go through a, a case study to uh, uh, to discuss it. Um, we'll then move on to discuss a bit of basic in terms of financial statements and how to use them. And we'll also look at how other stakeholders external to your uh, organizations may look at uh, your, uh, some, for example, some of your financial ratios. Then we'll move on to financial forecasting, looking at your income expenses um, uh, and cash flow. Um, and we'll finish with some like, more general ideas on how to improve uh, financial resilience. Um, there will be time at the end of the session for questions, but as mentioned before, like, feel free to interrupt me any any time uh, you want to ask uh, uh, a question. So in terms of the introduction, the reason why uh, uh, I think we're all here is that uh, um, COVID brought a lot of changes uh, and a lot of risks uh, to um, basically like uh, all, uh, all of us, all organizations, um, uh, uh, no, no matter in which area you, uh, you operate. Um, and um, we in finance and management uh, love a bit of jargon. So events like COVID are uh, usually called black swan events. So these are uh, events that are almost impossible to, to predict, uh, but will have a huge impact on uh, the environment and, and the, uh, uh, all the organizations and, uh, and, and businesses. Um, and there are some key principles um, and elements of good practice that you can put in place uh, that will help you in the short, medium and long term to um, improve your uh, financial um, uh, resilience in response to events uh, uh, like COVID or like Brexit, uh, which uh, also had the impact on, uh, on, on some organization. And I know that uh, you are busy and may not have time to do uh, everything. Um, so uh, from the things that we'll be discussing uh, today, um, choose what feels right for your organization, depending on uh, on your size, your sector, the resources that you uh, you have um, at, at hand. Um, so, um, just a, uh, a few more questions to uh, get us uh, started in the in, in this session uh, uh, today. So I think it's fair to, to assume that uh, COVID did have an impact on uh, on your finances. How would you assess your current financial uh, position? Um, uh, did you uh, did you manage to uh, overcome some of the challenges uh, that COVID brought? I, do you think you're back on uh, track, back to back to normal, or is it still uh, difficult? And what tools would you use to like make that assessment of your financial position? Mick and Mandy, I'm not sure if that's an old hand or uh, or a new one. And you are on mute if you are talking. And we've lost them. Sorry, I didn't want to put you on uh, on this spot. Um, Steph, did you want to come in? Hello. Um, yeah. So I I um, kind of changed the way that I work during COVID and uh, so yeah I feel like I'm more back on track now but I'm doing things very differently so I've uh, yeah I've overcome the um, you know the, the problems that I had before um, so yeah I feel like I am I am um, I, I'm back on track it's just a different track <laughs> really um, and uh, if I may ask, like, what changes uh, to, uh, to the way you uh, uh, operate uh, did you introduce to, uh, to deal with the aftermath of COVID? Well, I, I, I've um, started um, doing more consultation work than I used to do. I used to do mainly um, design work and now I'm... I'm focusing far more on the consultation side of things. 
um, the businesses that I was working with before and during COVID, a lot of them had had um, problems. So I had to kind of look elsewhere for clients. So yeah, that that changed. So I think this is a, a very important thing that you've mentioned and something that we'll go uh, come back to at the end of this session that uh, such events like COVID uh, make us think about our business and our organization in, in a slightly different uh, uh, way. Um, and uh, we, like being forced to take a step back and think about your clients, their their changing uh, needs may actually be beneficial for uh, for your organization. And you may discover new business ideas. Um, but uh, that the process of um, uh, moving or shifting to to a slightly different ca uh, customer group or doing things differently uh, may be daunting and may also take a while before you get a foothold uh, in your new um, uh, market. Um, Catherine, I think you've mentioned that uh, uh, you also uh, now have some new ideas, uh, including, uh, as far as I remember, a podcast. Is this something that uh, uh, you came up with uh, in response to COVID or was this like, independent or? Um, well, I'm a gigging musician, so before COVID, most of my income came from leaving the house and gigging in front of people. So that all stopped. And uh, and I talked with our very own Steph Cronin right here. And I'd never heard the term audio branding before all of this. And so when when she said that word, I, well, I was just all over it. And I thought, that's exactly what I want to do. Um, so it's, it's through COVID that I've started, well, I just fell into it. Um, doing background music for video, podcast theme music, uh, call waiting music, absolutely anything um, to do with recorded music. And and I'd like to keep that going, even though I'm back out gigging now, I need to just balance both businesses um, and, and keep the recording up. Perfect. And Andy, did you want to come in? Uh, yeah, m my circumstances were... were um sort of similar I, I suppose where i am at the moment I'm, I'm kind of trying to relaunch what i'm doing i suppose in a way I was, I was a writer well i still am but i got um a musical that was literally just about to tour i'd never done it before i got a big arts council grant and we got um cancelled literally the day before we were due to do the inaugural tour um and so that was largely grant funded, but would have generated income through box office, et cetera, et cetera, and could have potentially gone on. But I kind of quite quickly realized that nothing much was going to happen over the next kind of period of time. And the problem with musicals is that there's such a lot of, um, uh, such a long lead time between writing something and ever getting it as an income generating uh, situation. So while I thought I was on for a kind of a really good kickstart with that, um, and it may still happen that there's talk about potentially spring next year. Um, realistically, it's, you know, that's, that's spring next year and beyond. Um, so, I mean, I've always written songs and so I kind of got this notion that I could potentially go out and try and um, promote myself as a, as a performer, um, singer songwriter kind of idea. So, um, it, which is a very, very different kind of kettle of fish to what I was doing before, which was very much behind the scenes, if you like. It was uh, it was more production um, and um, and the writing side of it. I was involved musically in the, in the tour, but uh, uh, you know the singer songwriter idea is it's, it's a fundamentally different approach to trying to earn money through music. So uh, that's kind of where I am really. But um, income at the moment is. Uh, let's say minimal to zero, um, but the idea is it won't always be. Um, I, I like the, the spirit and thank you for uh, uh, being uh, keeping it, uh, it optimistic. But I think what we can hear uh, in all these stories is that um, um, a mix of your like, products or services is really, uh, really important and um, your uh, different um, uh, offerings may uh, 
behave differently or the different customer uh, groups uh, uh, may be in a different position uh, and uh, uh, willingness to buy may be, may be different. Uh, so it is really important to keep, uh, keep the, the mix, portfolio mix in, in mind where uh, we're thinking about uh, uh, your uh, uh, business and diversifying income. Um, so um, I think that this was a very uh, good and helpful uh, in introduction and today we'll discuss some tools and techniques that can be helpful um, uh, with uh, with your financial uh, management and will focus on, uh, among others, on uh, income and expenditure forecasting. Um, and uh, for example, we'll uh, uh, see at uh, like different income for forecasting uh, approaches, depending on whether you forecast income for your existing uh, operations or uh, a completely new market segment. We'll talk um, about cash flow forecasting because, of course, uh, this is uh, uh, a big issue for uh, all organization. Uh, we'll also discuss the sensitivity uh, analysis, uh, which will help you test some of your assumptions going, uh, going forward. Um, but uh, I said that we'll start uh, with with a short uh, a case study and some examples of the importance of good financial planning and um, and management. Um, so um, normally, what we do in this uh, session is we uh, show uh, uh, a short video uh, which uh, focuses um, in in an unexpected way. Um, uh, uh, about uh, on uh, why it's uh, important to uh, uh, keep uh, track um, uh, of of your finance. Uh, but I know in in the past that um, uh, some people mentioned that uh, the video doesn't necessarily work uh, doesn't necessarily work well for them if um, I show uh, if I share my screen. Um, so I will. I've just posted um, uh, a YouTube link. Uh, it's a video that uh, takes uh, one minute. Uh, so if you can go to YouTube, um, watch uh, this video um, and then uh, come back to, uh, to us and we will uh, uh, we'll have uh, a discussion about what we've just seen. And do let uh, uh, us know if you have any technical difficulties. I can't seem to get it to work, uh, Agata, but um, if I'm honest, I think I've seen it before, judging by the still there, so I've got a hunch that so, it's uh, probably not worth, uh, worth trying to figure it out for me, but I remember being pretty blown away by it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so um, if if you know it, it will yeah. not have the same kind okay. of... Uh... I'll say nothing anyway, I'll keep quiet until I've seen it. Jane also mentioned that uh, she's having an issue yeah, I think it's my computer, though, to be honest. It's uh, it's a really old, um, old computer. I'll, I'll just try and copy and paste the link and try that. If you did watch the video, let us know when when you back.
Okay, are people back with us? I can see some nods, yes. Uh, so if you didn't manage to uh, to watch the, uh, the video, don't, don't worry. It was just um, a film to uh, start a discussion about things that we may miss in our every uh, everyday uh, lives. Uh, so um, the video showed um, uh, uh, a basketball, two basketball teams passing uh, passing the ball uh, uh, between uh, each other. Uh, but there was um, an, an unexpected uh, guest, the uh, a moonwalking bear. Um, but oftentimes people who are busy uh, looking at the basketball game uh, fail to notice the the bear um, and uh, the video was uh, done by uh, TFL to warn people um, uh, about uh, a cyclist who we may miss um, uh, when driving uh, cars but actually I think it is re very relevant to um, our financial uh, discussion because most risks uh, to your organization or to your business uh, financial stability may be obvious when you know what to look for and for example, if you uh, if you analyze your records, um, but you may miss some of them if you either don't know what where to look for, or you you're just so focused on and and, and engrossed on day to day operations, uh, meetings, delivery work, uh, managing your your diary that you don't have time to think about uh, a bigger a bigger picture. Um, so this is what we'll uh, try to do uh, today. We'll also uh, try to look for some uh, uh, hidden hidden bears. And now why uh, financial um, uh, uh, performance is so uh, so important. I said that we would start with uh, with a case study, and this is a case study of an organization that uh, you might have heard before, um, Kids Company. Uh, so that was a charity that was founded in 1990 uh, 96, um, and um, it delivered services uh, for uh, uh, children uh, in um, uh, deprived uh, city areas, uh, mainly in London, but also in a few uh, other places uh, nationally. Um, and it was quite a successful organization. For example, it won the Ensign and Young Social Entrepreneur of the, of the Year Award. Um, it grew relatively quickly. Uh, it operated 11 children's centers um, and delivered services uh, in over 40 schools. Um, in 2013, it turnover uh, was over 23 uh, million pounds, and most funding uh, came through cent uh, central government and also some local uh, government grants. So, and the organisation seemed to be flourishing. But then, in 2015, it was first reported that they have um, uh, financial difficulties, and soon, very soon after, it ceased um, uh, operations. Um, and uh, only two weeks ago, uh, the Charity Commission published um, a long-awaited report into the closure of the, the company six years uh, after uh, they closed the door. So this case study, even though uh, it happened several years ago, it's still uh, very uh, 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 often uh, analysed. Um, and you may remember some of the headlines from uh, from the times where uh, when they went uh, bust uh, and it did receive quite a lot of press coverage. Uh, so now we'll have um, a look at some financial uh, information um, on the kids company. So here you have uh, information on their income, spending and the number of employees uh, for six years uh, between 28 and 2013. Um, and I know that this is just uh, a few, few numbers and you may not have uh, all the background information uh, about, about them, uh, but just based on this information, uh, how would you um, assess uh, their financial uh, situation? Um, does it seem uh, good? And can you see any potential red flags here? Mm -hmm. 
Steph, did you want to come in? Um, well, it looks like they're they're kind of living hand to mouth, really. There's not much left over at the end of, of the year. Um, and they've got a lot of employees there. So um, there's a lot of responsibility. So if if they lost any of their income, they'd not be able to pay their employees um, and or anything else, really. Yes, I think you uh, you covered uh, uh, two very very important uh, points. So um, I've added uh, a few uh, additional information uh, here, but uh, there definitely are some positives. So income is growing year on year, um, and um, uh, they do manage to uh, uh, at least break even or up were profitable in all years except for uh, uh, 2029. 20, uh, uh, so it it may not look as uh, such such a bad position to be, and uh, probably some of the, you would uh, uh, would like to have uh, 23 million of uh, income per uh, uh, per year. Uh, but two very important red flags that Steph uh, just mentioned. Um, um, the it looks like they have uh, very limited reserves, potential overinvestment, because uh, over the six years, uh, the total increase in income was the same as the total uh, percentage increase in uh, in spending. And for the last two years, you can see that um, uh, spending was growing much faster than than the income uh, and the high number of employees um, which means that um, income per FTE was uh, decreasing so again like this may be natural as, as an organization grows uh, because each uh, additional em employee is, uh, um, is, is, is the potentially like has a, a lower marginal impact on, uh, on, on your organization. But it may indicate a like, decreased efficiency uh, or the fact that, that they may have been overstaffed uh, uh, given, uh, given their uh, uh, income size. And the key reason for um, this organization uh, going best was um, a serious cash flow problem. Uh, so they operated, as Steph, uh, Steph mentioned, on the financial knife edge. Uh, they didn't manage to build any reserves or had no financial cash in uh, to safely invest in new uh, activities uh, and, and locations. But there were also plenty of um, um, issues that were underpinning the situation or uh, which could explain why they ended up in, uh, in such a difficult cash flow uh, position because to be honest that's something that uh, a well managed organization should uh, uh, should be on uh, on top uh, of uh, but here there were uh, a bunch of issues with um, financial management uh, so a very poor budgeting uh, uh, process uh, and very limited processes uh, which aimed at reviewing uh, the spend against against the budget, uh, which resulted in an ability to build uh, sufficient financial reserves. Then poor record keeping, um, which resulted in um, issues with uh, when, when it came to uh, paying taxes and also some inappropriate accounting uh, that were uh, that was um, uh, after uh, under investigation when the organization uh, went down the, uh, the, the doors even in uh, uh, the, the, there were some co court proceedings which looked um, at potential criminal aspect of this. Um, very poor internal controls about who spent money on what um, um, and uh, the organizational culture which meant that uh, people didn't feel they need to stick to uh, to uh, to the budget. Um, lack of clear strategic planning on the priorities for uh, for the organisation and resources needed to uh, to achieve the, the priorities. Um, some lack of clear measurement of the impact. Um, 
and um, not enough uh, or very limited uh, scrutiny in terms of the uh, governance uh, 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 processes, the use of funds and the effectiveness of, uh, uh, of the services. Um, so you can see that uh, uh, cash flow issue was really just uh, a tip of, uh, of the iceberg here. Um, and there are a few things that we can learn from this uh, uh, this case study. Uh, so the first one is around the importance of cash flow and uh, and reserves. So uh, you will hear hear me uh, repeating like mantra today that cash flow is king, uh, and this is really important because even a profitable organization can uh, go bankrupt. Um, and reserves are uh, really. Uh, uh, vital. Uh, and of course, um, many organizations relied on reserves to stay afloat during the, the pandemic, um, which was uh, a, a natural thing to do. Uh, but it's probably a, a time for you to start thinking uh, how to uh, rebuild uh, uh, them to, uh, to be able to resist uh, uh, future shocks. And now different organizations will need uh, to take very different approaches to uh, uh, to reserves. Um, what's appropriate for you will depend on, on your costs, uh, how predictable your income uh, is, and the inherent, inherent risk involved in delivering your, uh, your work. Um, but generally, uh, uh, there's a rule of thumb that uh, you should aim to hold three to six months of operating costs in reserves, if you can, uh, of course. Um, and it's really important that uh, every organization or every business considers how to determine what the right level of reserves is for you. Um, and if you, uh, for like slightly larger organizations, if you don't have a reserves policy, that's probably something that you should uh, you should look at. Um, and uh, there are some good resources available uh, online. I've uh, linked here uh, one of them uh, that will help you establish what the right uh, level of reserves is for you. Now, the second point focuses on the diversifying funding, and that's something we've already touched on in our like, introductory conversations. And it uh, looks like uh, this is something that you are um, uh, already, uh, already doing. Um, but I think many organizations will recognize kids' companies' reliance um, on a small number of sources of funding or uh, on, on a relatively small number of, uh, of customers. Um, uh, and the funding or income generating uh, landscape is quite uh, challenging following uh, COVID. Um, so um, if you do rely uh, on a small number of contracts, um, it's really important that uh, uh, that you manage the relationship with, with your customers or funders um, and plan for sustainable uh, income. And as discussed, you should consider how to diversify your revenue. And this could be done through a number of things, uh, thinking about new clients, new market, uh, markets, new sources um, uh, of funding. Um, of course, it might be slightly easier for charitable organizations where uh, you have access to some uh, new uh, funding streams, such as uh, donations, fundraising, uh, etc. But it's quite a, a quite a practical uh, a tool, which uh, uh, is um, an Excel-based uh, uh, funding and income planner, which might help you uh, uh, assess the uh, stability of various um, funding sources, and also looks at the uh, risks of different funding sources. And I've also linked. Uh, it for you here, and of course you will uh, get the slides uh, after this uh, uh, this session. And the third thing focuses on reviewing your governance arrangements. Uh, so of course these arrangements will depend on uh, your organization, your legal form. Um, for larger organizations or for charities, you will have a board of uh, trustees or you may have a supervisory board. Um, and it's really important that you review the skills and experience of people who sit on, on your board to make sure that um, 
uh, they have a str uh, strong levels of uh, financial governance and can also provide you with uh, uh, with practical um, support for um, small businesses for sole traders this is a more tricky area uh, because in many cases you are doing everything on on your own uh, but here you uh, you can probably consider um, having uh, a professional uh, a financial expert uh, or accountant uh, giving you support or if this is not uh, not an option um, finding a, a, a critical friend, um, someone who is uh, not your competitor, uh, who is also a sole trader and um, uh, who you can speak to and um, uh, who can provide you with uh, some uh, guidance uh, or even if someone who you can share your experiences with. Um, and as long as this uh, uh, program continues, feel free to use your um, individual uh, coach as such a critical friend who can uh, provide you with a bit more hands on guidance in terms of your financial position. So now, unless there are any questions or comments on on the case study, uh, we'll move on uh, and discuss quite quickly um, uh, financial statements because um, I will try to keep it practical and uh, 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 it will not be a one-to-one um, -one on how to to build financial statements but if you are interested in uh, more in-depth information uh, in this area do let me know and I will be able to share um, some additional materials with you. Uh, but I'm sure you all know that there are three key financial statements. So um, these are a balance sheet, um, a profit and loss account, uh, which is also called an income statement, and a statement of cash flows. And we can think about the balance sheet as, as a picture or because it shows a snapshot of organization's financial position at, at a single point in time. Um, and profit and loss and statement cash flows uh, are dynamic documents uh, which uh, show changes uh, in your financial uh, performance or your cash levels um, over a given period. Um, it is usually one year, but uh, when discussing cash flows, we can uh, will discuss that um, you can do a uh, cash flow forecast with uh, very different time horizons. So these two documents are more uh, like uh, like a movie. Now, do you have any thoughts uh, on which financial statement is the most important one? Any ideas? Remember, there are no bad answers, so uh, you can shout anything that comes to your mind. Yes, Andy. Uh, well, they probably all got it bottom down, but I dare say your cash flow one is most important because that's one that keeps uh, uh, whereby you can keep your eye on any kind of urgent looming issues that you're about to run into, perhaps, aren't you? Yeah, ab absolutely. So. Each financial statement tells um, a slightly different story and it's important in its own right. They're also like it all in, interconnected, uh, but we will be mentioning, uh, uh, as I said, as, as a mantra today, that uh, cash is king. Uh, so your cash flow is like, really uh, critical and something that you, um, you should be definitely looking at, even if it's uh, not necessarily required by, uh, by law. But uh, looking very briefly at a balance sheet. Um, so a balance uh, sheet uh, shows what you own versus what you owe uh, as, as an organization. Um, so uh, I'm sure that you are probably pretty familiar with uh, 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 these structures. So I will not be spending too much time uh, on this. Um, but um, there, there may be a few reasons why you need to, 
need to balance uh, a sheet um, uh, it, um, and why you should be looking at uh, uh, at, at and analyzing your balance sheet. So it can show some risks to your organization, um, which are important to you as, as a business owner, but that, uh, equally that are like really important uh, to some external stakeholders that may be looking at your financial statements. So a balance sheet will be used, for example, when you uh, want to secure a business loan um, or other type of working capital, uh, capital and in some cases for organizations that um, apply for uh, larger uh, tenders, um, commissioners will also uh, want to have a look uh, at your financial statements to assess your financial uh, position, uh, just to make sure that you do provide a, a required level of financial stability um, over the duration of, uh, of the contract. And if we Look at a, um, an example of uh, of um, of a balance uh, uh, sheet. Uh, things that people will want to focus on um, is, uh, for example, comparing your current assets uh, to current liabilities, uh, because uh, this shows whether your organization can cover its short term obligations. Um, and if your current liabilities exceed your cash balance, uh, your organization may require additional working capital from outside sources. So this is something that is, of course, even even more visible on day to day basis in uh, in your cash flow statement. Uh, but for example, if if you're applying to a bank for for a loan, uh, this is one of the ratios that uh, people will definitely analyze. So your working capital um, or solvency ratio, which looks um, uh, at a comparison between your current assets and current liabilities. And if this ratio is below zero, it raises a warning sign as to whether the organization is able to pay its short term obligations. Um, so another ratio that people will be looking at when analyzing your balance sheet um, is uh, also uh, your debt levels. Uh, and of course, not every business or not every organization has uh, uh, debt, uh, but debt itself is not necessarily bad. It's just like one of many ways uh, of um, uh, finding um, uh, cash to fund your uh, your business. But of course, if you have too much debt on your balance sheet, it uh, raises um, uh, uh, a risk. So people will uh, want to have a look at the debt to equity ratio um, and a high ratio means that uh, the business has been growing due to debt or what we call leverage. Now financial uh, organizations or commissioners will also interested in how some of these ratios change over time rather than just um, having a look uh, uh, at one year uh, in information um, so, for example, looking at the same uh, debt to equity uh, ratio, um, um, people uh, people will want to know whether there's been a, um, uh, a sudden change in uh, in the these numbers. Because if a company operates on a high leverage uh, over a long time, but uh, is managed has managed to maintain this uh, th this ratio. It's not as alarming as a company with a low debt ratio, with which sudden suddenly shows um, a, a spike. So another uh, key financial statement is your profit and loss statement, um, and. This is um, a, um, a financial document which looks at the efficiency uh, with uh, which your organization operates. Uh, so it starts with what we call a top line. So your uh, turnover or income um, from sales and, and, and operations over a given uh, uh, period of time. Uh, then it looks at cost of sales. So this is cost of, 
the cost of products and services sold within the same uh, uh, period uh, of time. Um, so these will be costs like materials or like direct staff costs linked to to the services that uh, uh, that uh, you uh, you sold. Um, and uh, cost of sales usually move um, in line with uh, with your turnover. Um, and if we compare the turnover with the uh, cost of sales, we have gross profit. Then we look at operating costs. So these are like all the like usually fixed costs, like your overheads, uh, administration, rent, marketing, uh, research, um, costs that may change uh, year over year. But this is largely to, uh, driven by management decision to to allocate resources to uh, to your uh, priorities uh, rather than being directly linked to uh, uh, to your sales. And if we compare your turnover with all cost um, and tax, we uh, get to net profit, so your bottom line. And again, you will need a, a profit uh, and loss statement um, for you to uh, keep track of uh, changes uh, and financial position of your uh, organization uh, for your investors, uh, creditors, commissioners. Um, and also you will go through this exercise to file uh, uh, taxes. And here the key ratios to look at is uh, gross margin. So gross, uh, gross profit divided by uh, your turnover. And it shows uh, your organizations or your business efficiency um, uh, at uh, uh, producing your goods or services and a net profit, um, which is net profit over your uh, turnover, which is an all inclusive metric of uh, uh, profitability. Um, and I'm not sure whether you've uh, ever had such um, uh, uh, experiences, but these things can be uh, really important. For example, um, I was uh, helping an organization uh, bid for quite a large uh, tender issued by uh, by a local authority, uh, and they did re require some financial uh, information uh, from the financial statements over the past uh, several years to assess the financial stability, uh, and they were looking at these uh, ratios. Uh, and the organization that I worked with actually didn't meet uh, like one of the thresholds um, for uh, 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 for the financial stability assessment, uh, but because they knew exactly uh, why it was uh, happening and they had a very good reason for for this, we were, were able to go back to uh, commissioners and explain uh, in a detailed way the reasons for not meeting the thresholds, and we were uh, admitted to uh, uh, to bid. Uh, for this, this tender. So th this is um, uh, probably a warning that um, uh, people shouldn't look at these ratios in, in a very like, mechanic uh, way because um, uh, there's more uh, to financial stability than uh, some of these numbers, uh, although they are quite important. Um, so just uh, to sum up uh, this part of the, the presentation, we uh, we have uh, a case study with um, just uh, a few numbers. Um, I know that some people mentioned that they uh, don't feel very happy about uh, numbers, uh, or, uh, so I don't want to be torturing uh, you. Um, but uh, if you don't find it uh, that daunting, um, could you uh, could you have a look at these numbers and um, calculate the gross margin for uh, for this uh, this organization? Um, and you have um, uh, all the formulas here. So uh, gross margin is uh, gross profit over a ton turnover.
activity. You may be doing your your calculations. Um, I can always uh, help you. Um, so the gross margin, uh, gross um, uh, profit, that's 40k over turnover, uh, 120k. So the gross margin is 33%. Then we have the net margin ratio. So the net margin is the net profit, which is 6K over turnover, 120K. So this will be 5%. And the working capital ratio, this is current assets, so 40K minus current liabilities. 42k. This is below zero, which means that the company is in financial or maybe in financial difficulty. Now, we may ask, um, we know that the working capital situation here is not great, but what about the gross margin and net margin ratios? Are they any, any good? Would you be happy if these were the ratios describing your organization. It is actually quite a, quite a, a tricky question because these ratios can be uh, different depending, um, for example, on, on the sector in, in which you, uh, you operate. Um, as a rule of thumb, we assume that 5% um, is a relatively low margin, 10% in, in terms of the net, net, mar net profit margin, 10% would be um, a healthy uh, net profit margin and 20% is, is a very uh, high net profit uh, margin. Um, but of course, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, your ideal profit and profit margin will align with these numbers. But for example, if you are looking for uh, some external uh, funding, if you are submitting a, a business plan, uh, these are the uh, like ratios or results that people will uh, will be uh, usually expecting from from your uh, organization, so uh, so it may be worth knowing these uh, thresholds. And now, last but not least, uh, as mentioned before, probably the single most important uh, uh, financial document, your cash flow uh, statement. And it's really important because it shows the organization ability to like pay your uh, pay your debts pay your invoices um, and it's the same for small or big organizations so for example here you uh, you have an example of one of the bigger organizations uh, globally uh, general electric um and uh, the CEO uh, said that if he had to run a company on three measures, those measures would be customer satisfaction, employee satisfaction, and cash flow. Um, so even for such uh, such large organization, he still believed that cash, cash flow is absolutely critical. And you can see that only one out of three uh, uh, measures that he would use uh, was focused on finances, and it was only cash flow, not not profit. And statement of uh, cash flows shows the uh, cash amounts entering and leaving uh, a company in in a, in a period um, and good financial planning involves um, uh, estimating um, um, how much uh, income and how much expenditure you will have uh, but the um, timing here is really uh, really vital so you need to know when you are expecting the these uh, cash flows and if you are not uh, doing uh, 
cash flow projections or uh, if you don't keep record of your cash flow set at the moment. There are some very helpful uh, templates available online. Uh, I've including two examples here, but uh, you can you can find many, uh, many more uh, like pre-built templates uh, that are uh, free and ready, uh, ready to use. Um, online. Some of them are very simple, probably better for sole traders, smaller organizations. Some can be quite uh, sophisticated um, and also uh, uh, there are templates for uh, different uh, horizons. So you may be doing your cash flow daily, monthly, quarterly, uh, yearly, and uh, the are the, the, like separate templates that may help you um, to maintain your projections uh, and records for all time horizons. And now um, we've mentioned this uh, already before that even a profitable organization um, can uh, go bankrupt because there are some key differences between cash flow and profit and loss statements. Um, and of course, the two are closely linked, uh, but they are they show different things and the, uh, there is a different philosophy and accounting principles um, uh, underpinning the, the statements. Um, so, um, for example, when you sell your services or your products, um, uh, when you make a sale, uh, sale, it shows up on, on your profit and, and loss report uh, straight away. Uh, but in real life, uh, you may not be paid for, uh, for some time. Um, and of course, in some circumstances, hopefully not, but it also may happen that um, your client defaults and uh, you, you never get a payment. Uh, or another difference is when you purchase uh, larger equipment um, and it fixed um, uh, assets, uh, the cost of equipment um, in your profit at loss account is spread over uh, a useful uh, life. So this is called depreciation. Um, but in terms of cash, it has uh, impact right here, uh, right now. And there are several other differences. So, for example, like taking a loan will have a different impact on your PL and then different impact on your cash and flow. Um, and similarly, uh, a VAT, if, if you are uh, a registered uh, uh, VAT uh, organization, um, VAT doesn't affect your uh, profits uh, because it's actually not your money, but it uh, passes through through your business. And that's uh, that that may be um, quite difficult for smaller organization uh, to, to forget or uh, do not manage to set aside uh, enough money um, for uh, tax uh, payments when when they are due. So these are uh, some of the differences which show uh, why uh, a profitable organization may have significant uh, issues with with cash flow. And um, you've mentioned um, uh, that um, cash flow is the most important thing. So, uh, so I think this shows that uh, you are um, uh, already looking at uh, at cash flow. Um, so in your experience, um, what are the key reasons for poor cash flow? Uh, and is there anything that you are doing to improve uh, cash flow uh, in your business? Andy, I think you've mentioned that uh, cash flow is uh, important. So uh, is there anything that you uh, do to improve your cash um, flow? I suppose that there's... Trying to chase up poor payers um, on the income side um, and trying to maximise on the expenditure side, trying to maximise your own terms. Um, I think back to when, uh, when when we were about to tour our show, and it, I did have a cash flow forecast, uh, which was absolutely crucial because I predicted it was a six week tour. Um, 
and we got grant money coming in at various times. We were going to get money back from theatres at various times. And I was utterly paranoid that because we, we were paying actors and you pay, we were paying the actors right throughout rehearsals. So a large part of the amount of the money was going out up front before we started to get incoming from the theatres, from ticket sales. Um, so we did have very much in mind the fact that we might need to negotiate with some of the theatres in order to try and see if they could release funds earlier because basically even after you've performed you were due to get the money in um i forget what it was it, some of it was kind of quite a long way delayed um because the nature of what we were doing and the theatres were trying to be supportive they were quite responsive to those requests actually um but it was um it, it was something that when i got it all planned out you could see where the um projected difficulties were going to come um and you could also i suppose just try and make sure that you had um you had, you tried to do everything you possibly could do to mitigate it you know where possible if need be trying to work out where what what expenses we might be able to shuffle into the following month uh perhaps and delay the timing of so it was quite all quite helpful well it was more than helpful it was it felt like it was a really essential process i've come across cash flows before but actually it if i'm honest with you it was only when when i actually found myself in the situation for in real life rather than a theoretical thing that it really started to become very understandable um because you were dealing with real real situations mm -hmm. rather, and that to me all of a sudden it, it kind of really registered how, how vital it was um because i was i was i was paranoid about not having any money to be able to pay people who were, we were supposed to be paying yes yeah so i think that this is really important what you just said that you may have um, a great business idea um you may know that it works in 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 the long term uh, uh, but cash flow may be a matter of uh, life and and death uh, mm -hmm. uh, almost um um, and uh, there may be like many examples, oh, many reasons uh, of poor cash flow. Um, sometimes this is just an intrinsic uh, uh, element of of your business and how uh, how people uh, uh, deal um, with, um, with, uh, with 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 payments. Um, there are also some things that you can um, try um, and and improve, uh, but of course the starting point, as Andy said, is always like being on top of your cash flow uh, projections and knowing uh, where uh, the, the the bottleneck is, and then you can um, uh, you can try to speed up a receipt of uh, of payment. Um, in some businesses, it is appropriate to offer, for example, uh, early bird uh, discounts um, uh, to uh, encourage uh, people to pay for your uh, services as quickly as possible um, at a slightly discounted uh, uh, rate. Um, uh, you can also try and negotiate uh, favorable payment terms uh, with uh, with your suppliers um, or for larger organizations. Uh, I think it's quite important to have sp spending guidelines um, and making sure that uh, all staff within your organization who hold any kind of budget uh, are resp uh, uh, aware of uh, what this money can be uh, can be spent uh, uh, spent on. Um, and we're moving to uh, financial forecasting, and um, I think uh, you are uh, uh, all uh, very aware of the importance of uh, uh, financial forecasting for. Uh, for your uh, businesses. Um, so we'll um, uh, have a quick look at uh, key financial forecasts, including uh, income expenditure, and we've already touched on cash flow forecast. So in terms of um, your uh, income forecasts, uh, there are two key approaches to uh, projecting uh, your income. Uh, these are so-called top-down and bottom-up projections. 
uh, and they're, they're both uh, valid uh, methods. Uh, they will be uh, useful in different situations. So starting with what we have on the right hand side, side uh, a bottom up uh, projection. Uh, this is um, a method that is more appropriate for your existing products, existing services, uh, where you start with your current position as baseline and then you uh, think what changes to volume of, or, uh, of sales for each product or, of, or service you can expect over uh, over the next uh, year. So it's more uh, uh, focus on uh, looking at in incremental changes to what you are uh, already uh, doing. And it's uh, of course important that you focus both on volumes um, and your prices. Um, I think given the uh, current uh, situation, um, uh, inflation, uh, many organizations start uh, looking at their, uh, at their prices, uh, whether they are they are happy to maintain with uh, pricing as, um, uh, as as it is, or whether they actually need to uh, increase uh, pricing to cover some of the increased uh, cost of um, uh, of uh, operations. And this is particularly important if you have some long term contracts. Uh, for example, if you are locking uh, locking yourself. Um, uh, um, and your price uh, priceless uh, for uh, a long period of time, you probably want to have a look at your pricing strategies uh, uh, right uh, now. And then on the left hand side, uh, we have a top down approach to um, income forecasting. And this method is more appropriate when thinking about new products or new services. So something that um, um, uh, some of you mentioned you uh, you were doing uh, during during COVID or you are doing uh, right now, um, and this is more appropriate when looking uh, or working on your business plan, for example. Um, so here you have to start with uh, defining your uh, market uh, in which you want to to operate, uh, understanding the market size. Um, so uh, just to give you a practical example, let's say that um, um, I am uh, selling uh, a training to um, uh, people with learning uh, uh, the difficulty. Uh, I would uh, need to uh, start with understanding of what the, uh, the, the population of uh, my potential customers is uh, in the geographic area where I want to provide uh, services. Uh, but then I would need to think critically whether all of them are actually my um, potential target group. Um, uh, so uh, I would need to narrow uh, down uh, a particular segment of uh, of my uh, uh, customers, um, and then you define your uh, your market share. So, for example, uh, you may assume that um, uh, you will reach uh, reach out and provide services to two percent or five percent or ten percent of uh, uh, the potential existing clients in uh, in in your your market and you you're building uh, your projections from the top down um, of course this is a, a more uh, risky way of doing uh, doing projections so uh, when you start operating in um, in a new uh, market you would need to revisit these projections on a regular basis to make sure whether uh, you are uh, hitting the, the mark or or not in terms of expenditure for forecasting, um, uh, this is uh, probably slightly more uh, straightforward. Um, it helps uh, if you uh, divide all your expenditure um, um, into some key categories. Uh, so this will include the startup or uh, development uh, capital. Um, working capital, so your recurring expenditure and uh, capital one of larger purchases. Um, and here you'll notice that I have uh, two uh, red hour um, stars. Um, so these are the uh, areas that you should uh, uh, look at um, 
uh, in, in more detail at the moment, given the current uh, uh, situation and the increasing um, uh, utility costs and also increasing cost, cost of life. Um, so potentially uh, your salaries and employees costs and uh, your uh, utility bills may change in the future in comparison to what you were paying in, in the past. Um, and then when uh, when you do uh, when you have your uh, um, uh, income and uh, cost uh, projections ready, it's really helpful to look at them uh, and and understand what the key risks are to uh, to your uh, your organization. Um, and there will be different risks depending on your individual cir circumstances. Uh, but for example, if your organization has high fixed costs and low uh, low income uh, certain uh, certainty um, you can look at things that uh, you can start doing right now to start managing your uh, your risks uh, so these may be things like um, uh, allocating more cash to uh, to reserves uh, right now to mitigate the risk in uh, in the future or looking whether you can reduce uh, fixed um, costs and um, um, I was wondering if you do any active uh, risk management in in your organization so for example uh, do you maintain uh, risk registers uh, or is it more than uh, from your head uh, in 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 a more like, reactive way that if uh, if a risk materializes you act on on it as and when it happens Pamela, you, you uh, uh, work for a slightly, a slightly larger organization. So um, uh, how does risk management look like for, for you? Uh, do you do any active risk management or uh, is it more ad hoc? If, if you want to share with us and Thinking, of course, if if not, that's that's a okay. case. That so uh, I was wondering if if you could share um, how uh, uh, how you approach risk management. We're not a management. large organisation. We're literally uh, just started up when COVID hit, so we're back to square one. So sorry, I, I didn't realise you uh, mentioned my name. Sorry about that. So, okay. Yeah, we we have got. Um, an awareness of risk management, but we haven't had to use it as yet. So yeah. Fair enough. So that, that's probably something um, uh, to to focus on in um, in in the future. So in my experience, um, I found that um, creating um, um, a risk register, but one that is like practical, uh, practical and manage manageable, rather than being uh, a huge yeah. list of uh, risks that uh, someone like, pulled together and then it sits uh, in, in 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 a drawer. So uh, doing this with with a very practical approach, and then like uh, creating. Um, uh, a board assurance framework, so something that uh, your board could look at um, at uh, regular intervals, might be uh, might be helpful just to stay on top of the key uh, yeah, risks. Yeah, we've been operating in other people's buildings, so we've been covered by their insurance and their rules and regulations. It will probably apply when we get a building of our own. I should imagine it won't. Yes. Yeah. So another thing that you um, should consider when uh, you have uh, your uh, financial forecasts ready is to do a bit of sensitivity uh, analysis. Uh, and, and sensitivity analysis is a process of estimating how your um, uh, target variables so, or financial position changes in relation to changes to some input variables. Um, and you can al always look at um, uh, both positive uh, and 
negative scenarios. But of course, those uh, conservative or negative scenarios uh, will uh, have um, a potential bigger impact on uh, on the uh, on the organization. And uh, we'll walk together through a quick example of uh, of a sensitivity uh, analysis. Uh, so here we have um, a few numbers from an income statement. Um, so our organization is expecting a revenue of uh, 1 million. It has variable costs of 600,000, fixed costs of 200,000, which of course gives an operating margin of 200,000. If you were doing a sensitivity um, analysis based on uh, these numbers, which assumptions would you like to test? So people often uh, say, and this is an um, a natural uh, response that you would like to test uh, your revenue, um, and of course that's uh, uh, that that's right. We we all know that um, uh, uh, revenue uh, can differ significantly from our forecast, especially when if we said that that's a new market, uh, we're not really sure of our um, our assumptions, uh, but. Um, we need to make sure that uh, we are performing in sensitivity uh, analysis um, at the right level. Um, so, for example, um, looking at uh, revenue, we need to understand whether what will change is uh, the demand for our services or number of customers uh, or uh, or a price, because not every type of change in every revenue will have the same um, impact on operating margin. So um, now uh, I uh, give you a bit of more information on what is included in um, uh, in the sales forecast. Um, so we have an organization which is uh, sharing 100,000 units of something let's uh, let's say it's uh, uh, a number of tickets to uh, 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 to a music ven venue and each ticket uh, costs uh, 10 pounds um, and we are looking at two different uh, scenarios so in one scenario our volume goes down by 10 percent and in the second scenario uh, price of the ticket uh, goes down by 10 percent so both scenarios have the same impact on on the revenue so or our on our top line um, uh, which is now a uh, 900 thousand but the variable cost will uh, change differently depending whether we are looking at changes in volume or the changes in price if there is a drop in volume both revenue and variable costs will go down by 10%. Uh, but if there is a change in price, our variable costs will stay exactly the same. And our fixed costs in both scenarios remain the same. Uh, but you can see that the impact of these changes on operating margin is different. In the first scenario, where the volume goes down by 10%, um, there's a 20% um, drop in operating uh, margin. In the second scenario, where the price goes down by 10%, it has a much bigger 50 per, uh, leads to a 50% uh, drop in, in operating margin. So this is quite important where, uh, when doing um, a sensitivity uh, analysis to look at individual input variables separately. Uh, but this was a uh, one assumption at the, at the time time uh, type of analysis, and in real life, when things go wrong, they sometimes go uh, wrong uh, at all fronts. Um, so, for the sensitivity analysis, it's also helpful to uh, to have a look. Um, the worst case scenario where all our input variables um, um, 
go uh, go down. So, for example, here you have a third scenario where both volume and price went down by by 10 percent. Um, and um, you can see that 10 percent drop in volume and price um, lead to a 65 percent drop in in operating margin. Um, so this is a huge, uh, huge change, and uh, that's why a sensitivity analysis is so, so important, because um, uh, the impact of um, relatively small changes in um, our volume or price may have an exponential impact on uh, on our uh, bottom line and uh, operating margin. So with covered um, a more technical part uh, of this this session. Uh, now um, I only have a few slides left with uh, which focus on like, more general ideas and how to improve uh, financial resilience. Uh, but before we go uh, there, I just wanted to stop for, for a moment and check if there are any questions or any comments on what we've covered so far. I don't see any questions, so um, I will continue. Um, so when we started this uh, this session, uh, some of you mentioned that um, because of COVID, you had to uh, look at your uh, businesses through slightly different uh, different lenses. You had to look for new business opportunities. Uh, you had to diversify your uh, your income. Um, and this really is like looking um, uh, for financial resilience in, in in a nutshell. And of course, in difficult financial situation, um, sometimes it may be necessary to uh, uh, cut costs, um, but uh, there may be also other uh, strategies or ways um, of building uh, or increasing your financial resilience. And here we have um, eight potential strategies that uh, that you may consider. Of course, not all of them will be uh, relevant for all organizations or all uh, businesses. So you need to ask yourself what um, potentially makes sense uh, for you. But the first one is um, is um, about pricing. Uh, and it's really about asking yourself a question whether you are char charging a right uh, price. Um, and it may mean that you may need to uh, move your uh, pricing up or down, depending on, uh, on the starting point um, to to increase your uh, your revenue, so you may need to move your price up um, if uh, it currently doesn't cover your your cost. Uh, but it may be also helpful to consider whether actually moving your price down and attracting a larger number of uh, customers uh, might be might be helpful. So when thinking about pricing, always uh, consider potential changes in. Um, in both directions. The second uh, one focuses on volume. Uh, so whether you have opportunities um, uh, uh, to uh, sell more. So this is um, about um, finding potential new clients or new geographic markets um, for your existing services. Uh, or new distribution channels. So, for example, if uh, if you're uh, working in real life, whether there's something that you can start doing uh, remotely and selling your services online. The first uh, uh, strategy focuses on your um, portfolio or um, or a mix of your products and uh, and services, um, and it's. If you have a diversified uh, portfolio of, um, uh, of services, uh, it is important that you understand um, what margin uh, all these services or products have, um, because there may be some services that are more profitable, some will be less profitable, um, and uh, 
some may be generating laws uh, and you want to uh, make sure that you are focusing in focusing your resources on uh, uh, products and services with with a higher uh, margin. The third strategy focuses on uh, productivity. So can you do more with the uh, resources you have? And the first one is linked to this is, is about sourcing. So can you renegotiate your contracts with suppliers to get better terms or find new suppliers? Um, and um, for example, in terms of your um, telecom services or uh, uh, banking services, these organizations are notorious for offering uh, better terms and conditions for new customers uh, and um, uh, often forget about uh, existing customers. Uh, so in some cases, finding uh, new providers uh, or at least understanding what uh, uh, other providers uh, are charging um, and what terms that they are offering so that you can go back to your existing providers and renegotiate your terms might be useful. The sixth strategy focuses on new products um, um, and looks uh, whether you can develop new, uh, new services, uh, new offering, doing slightly different, uh, different things. Um, link to this is strategy number uh, seven, uh, which focuses on new revenue sources. Um, so for charitable organizations, this would be, for example, fundraising, corporate sponsorship. For other uh, uh, organizations, it might be looking at uh, uh, whether you can use, uh, for example, your assets or your uh, premises in, uh, in, in a different uh, way. Uh, so, for example, uh, renting your, uh, your space uh, or opening um, a trading act activity uh, uh, in, in your in your premises, um, finding partners who you could um, share your uh, office space with. Um, so thinking about uh, uh, all new revenue sources, not necessarily linked to your core services uh, and the key purpose of uh, why your organization or your business uh, uh, exists. Um, and the last uh, one here is about spending more. It may be a bit counterintuitive and of course it's not appropriate in um, all uh, uh, situations, but in some cases a short-term investment may increase your uh, financial resilience in, in the long term. For example, if you invest in marketing or if you invest in new skills for your business, uh, it may generate um, a positive return on investment um, over the long term. Um, of course, assuming that this is something that your uh, business can afford um, or in, in the short term. Now, of course, size does uh, matter. And um, uh, for some sole traders and um, uh, small businesses and uh, people who are self-employed, uh, 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 sometimes it goes down to uh, making sure that uh, you have um, all the uh, 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 foundations uh, uh, right. Um, so uh, my tips for sole traders and um, uh, uh, really small organizations uh, would be to like, start with uh, start with uh, with the basics. So for example, things like uh, setting up a, a business account. Um, of course, that's that's not a legal requirement um, because as a sole trader, um, um, all the money you earn is is yours. Um, but it might be easier for you to keep track of uh, all your uh, business um, income expenditures um, if you have uh, a business account um, and then you transfer your wage into your own personal um, account. That will help you to manage your money more uh, effectively and also ensure you aren't tempted to, to spend it all. Um, as some simple things like uh, invoicing immediately as soon as you have completed uh, uh, the work or you agreed uh, that the work 
you were uh, you were hired uh, hired for and making sure your invoice has all the relevant uh, in information so that it can be paid as quickly as possible uh, paying taxes uh, uh, on time uh, is um, uh, of course really important uh, but also as um, as a sole trader if uh, you are not registered for uh, for that uh, because your turnover doesn't exceed the, the uh, VAT uh, uh, threshold, um, you may s still consider uh, registering for uh, for VAT because in some circumstances um, it may be beneficial for uh, for your financial situation. But that's something that should be looked at in in more uh, detail potentially with uh, with a professional financial advisor because um, uh, for organisations below the VAT threshold, the impact of uh, that uh, registration may may differ. Now, um, as um, um, as a sole uh, trader, uh, you don't need to have uh, business insurance, uh, but um, uh, it uh, it may be um, uh, a good practice if that's something that uh, that you can uh, afford um, uh, on. Um, oh, and. Um, you may also remember that uh, even uh, if you operate as, as a sole tra a trader, contrary to popular belief, you can still uh, employ people. Uh, you just need to notify a HMRC uh, and you will also need, need to collect income and uh, um, a national interest uh, uh, contribution. Uh, but um, if you're struggling with doing everything on, uh, on your own, um, you may actually uh, extend your uh, uh, operations. Um, a very important thing is to uh, to get a company website. Um, and nowadays there are like relatively uh, simple tools. Uh, you may hire a professional to, to do your website, uh, but uh, there are tools that allow you to build your uh, own website, even with no technical knowledge uh, what whatsoever um, and it's as simple as uh, uh, building uh, a PowerPoint uh, presentation and uh, dragging and, and dropping uh, different shapes and the content where where you uh, where you want it so if you don't have a website um, definitely consider doing this and it doesn't need to be um, uh, expensive um, Setting, setting up a contingency uh, fund and plan is really important um, uh, for you to be able to uh, uh, to manage uh, your uh, business. For example, if you're unable to work due to uh, illness or range of other reasons. Um, and last but not least, uh, I would say um, consider incorporation if um, if that's the right thing uh, for you uh, to do. So uh, just because you started your business as a sole trader doesn't mean you have to uh, trade as one for, for the rest of your uh, your life and you can change your business legal status um, as your circumstances uh, change. And uh, of course, the registration process is slightly more complex than registering as um, a sole trader, uh, but in some cases, incorporation can reduce uh, the amount of income tax you, you pay on your business uh, uh, profits. And of course, it uh, makes your business a separate legal entity uh, from your personal uh, finances. Um, so it may be important for uh, managing uh, risk. Um, so again, it it may not be appropriate for everyone, uh, but um, if you think that this is something that uh, you want to consider and it it's it's a potentially a right um, moment for you to to do it, uh, speak to a business advisor or or an accountant uh, to find out uh, potential implications for your uh, uh, business. For some organizations, it it might be beneficial, uh, but again, it it will depend. And the very last uh, thing to cover to, uh, today uh, 
it's just uh, just a question that um, I want you to uh, to take away. If if there's one thing that I want uh, you to take uh, away from this session, it's it's not necessarily the uh, um, uh, financial uh, uh, ratios uh, or some of the uh, more technical stuff. Um, it's uh, it's this more general question. So. Um, Key question is why does a taxi driver have a copy or uh, of the opera schedule in in their car? Or maybe nowadays it's uh, more uh, an online access to uh, uh, opera uh, schedule rather than uh, than a paper thing. Any ideas? Any anyone wants to? Uh, Give a final shout. I promise that's uh, that's the, uh, the last thing I will ask you to today. Andy, and you're on mute. Yeah, I, I guess because that's where everybody knows where his business is going to come from. It has to yes. be in the right place at the right time. Yes, exactly. So, so it's also possible that um, a taxi driver is a big opera lover and uh, that they want to go to to opera the, themselves. Uh, but um, uh, it's uh, probably uh, it's more uh, probable that uh, they need to know where where the business is. And being a taxi driver is an example of the, of a business with a very volatile income. So on on a good day, you can earn quite a lot. But on a bad day, if you're not um, at the right time in, in the right place, you can earn close, close to nothing. Um, so the taxi driver needs uh, to know where the business is and where the customers are. Um, and that's something that uh, you all should be uh, thinking all the time because COVID changed so many things. Uh, change the expectations uh, of, of businesses, change the needs of um, people. People uh, like to do different things, like to interact with businesses in, in, in uh, different, uh, different ways. Uh, there are also new businesses um, growing after uh, COVID, which uh, managed to capitalize on some new new trends or new new needs. Um, so that's something that uh, that you should keep uh, thinking about all the time. Uh, are you in the right uh, place with the right offering? So as I've mentioned before, uh, I'm leaving you with my email address. Um, if you have any questions right now, I'm happy to, to answer them um, equally. If you want to get in touch after this session, please uh, feel free to, to do so. Uh, we'll share the slides uh, with you. Um, and just uh, a few uh, um, thank you notes uh, and uh, uh, housekeeping no notes uh, to finish this session. Um, as far as I know, this is uh, your last workshop. Uh, so big thank you for uh, engaging with uh, with all the workshops uh, throughout the program. Uh, the recordings will be also available via the Slack channel. Uh, but we'll share the slides with you uh, via your email as well to, to make it easier uh, for you. Um, you can still receive support from your coaches until uh, the end of March. So if you want to have a more like in-depth conversation about anything that we've discussed uh, today, uh, you can also do it with um, with uh, your uh, coach. Um, and I believe uh, there's um, an end of program network and learning event uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, held at Barnsley uh, Civic, so I um, hope you're planning to, uh, to attend the, this event. Um, a big thank you. Um, uh, if you have um, any questions, do let me know um, and um, I wish you uh, a good rest of your day. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you.